Our chalice lighting words this morning come from the Reverend Dr. Rebecca Savage. We light our flaming chalice each week with a simple spark to make our holy our time together. With this flame, may our highest intentions be refreshed. With this flame, may we remember who we are and whose we are. With this flame, may our faith be renewed and reignited to guide our journey. Amen, and may it be so. What is going to happen? Will everything be okay? What can I do? In these days, we find ourselves too often stuck with these questions on repeat. What's going to happen? Will everything be okay? What can I do? We grasp at signs and markers, articles of news and analysis, Facebook memes and forwarded emails, as if they were the new zodiac, capable of forecasting all that life may yet bring our way, as if we could prepare, as if life had ever made any promises of making sense or turning out the way we would thought, as if we are not also actors in this still unfolding story. For this hour, we gather to surrender to the mystery, to release ourselves from needing to know, the yearning to have it all figured out, and also the burden of believing we either have all the control or none. Here, in our song and our silence, our stories and our sharing, we make space for a new breath, a new healing, a new possibility to take root. That is courage forged in the fire of our coming together and felt in the spirit that comes alive in this act of faith, that we will believe still that a new world is possible, that we are creating it already, here and now. Come, let us worship together. And let us join in singing our opening hymn this morning, which is in your uh, order of service and also in your hymnal, number 115. God of grace and God of glory, and I invite you to Rise in body or in spirit as you are willing and able.
Good morning. Good morning. It's so wonderful to see those of you who are here with us in the sanctuary, and it's wonderful to be with those of you who are here virtually on Zoom on this cold and sunny March morning. And I hear that there was a lovely gathering last night that had a lot of fabulous energy and raised $520. So thank you so much to those who participated in the Irish celebration. We're really grateful that after two years of postponement, it was able to happen. And on that note about postponement and events and being together and how we are together and whether we can have refreshments in the common room, there's so many questions as many different places in our communities shift their norms once again around COVID safety. Our reopening task force will be meeting on Wednesday the 23rd and I've already heard from some of you with different concerns and questions and hopes for how uh, we might move in any shifts to our guidelines if we choose to make changes. So I just encourage you if you have thoughts, desires, concerns, please do send them either to me or to other members of the reopening task force, which includes Wendy and Brad from our staff, as well as many lay leaders um, that you can, you can send your thoughts to. And we want to do what is, um, is in the best interest of our community, meets the most needs as possible. Otherwise, we have pretty regularly scheduled programming coming up, nothing too special to announce unless I'm missing something. Um, for those who have signed up, there will be the Maple Sugaring uh, Tour event on the 19th as part of our Earth Connections program. So uh, that will be exciting. And um, otherwise, we've got youth groups, book groups, small groups. We'll keep doing our groups. And it is very good to continue to gather. On that note, let's rise in body or in spirit as suits you to join in our unison affirmation. Love is the spirit of this church, and service is its law. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. El amor es el espíritu de esta iglesia. Y el servicio es su ley. Este es nuestro gran pacto. Vivir juntos en paz, buscar la verdad en el amor, y ayudarnos los unos a los otros. Good morning. My name is Marge Heckman, and I'm a member of the lay pastoral team here at First Parish. And at this point in the service, we pause to allow you to light a candle of joy or concern and I will light one final candle for all those joys and concerns we keep in our hearts. Thank you, Marge, for stepping into that role, and thank you for all of those who shared your joys and concerns this morning. The reading that I have chosen for us this morning is, from, is actually from the introduction to Sharon Salzberg's book called Faith, Trusting Your Own Deepest Experience. One day, a friend called to ask if we could meet for tea. Knowing that I was writing a book on faith from the Buddhist perspective, she was confused and she wanted to talk. How can you possibly be writing a book on faith without focusing on God? Isn't that the whole point? Her, her concern spoke to the common understanding that we have of faith that it is synonymous with religious adherence. But the tendency to equate faith with doctrine and then argue about terminology and concepts distracts us from what faith is actually about. In my understanding, whether faith is connected to a deity or not, its essence lies in trusting ourselves to discover the deepest truths on which we can rely. For some, this will be a very difficult approach to faith. Many link faith to narrow-minded belief systems, lack of intelligent examination, or pain of having one's own questions silenced. Faith might evoke images of submission to an external authority. 
Historically, the idea of faith has been used to slice cleanly between those who belong to a select group and those who do not. To fuel their own embittered agendas, fanatics harness what they call faith to hatred. I want to invite a new use of the word faith, one that is not associated with dogmatic religious interpretation or divisiveness, I want to encourage delight in the word to help reclaim faith as a fresh, vibrant, intelligent, and liberating word. This is a faith that emphasizes a foundation of love and respect for ourselves. It is a faith that uncovers our connection to others rather than designating anyone as separate and apart. The Buddha said, Faith is the beginning of all good things. No matter what we encounter in life, it is faith that enables us to try again, to trust again, to love again. Even in times of immense suffering, it is faith that enables us to relate to the present moment in such a way that we can go on, we can move forward, instead of becoming lost in resignation or despair. Faith links our present day experience, whether wonderful or terrible, to the underlying pulse of life itself. Here ends the reading. Indeed, First Parish is a place that holds our joys and our sorrows, where we can explore faith without God from Buddhists and hear beautiful music, and so much more. For all these reasons, please, we invite you to give generously to this morning's offering, and the offering will now be gratefully received.
Isn't it great to be here together and sing and hear music and, oh, I love it. Thank you so much, all of you. So the war in Ukraine continues, as Jen mentioned, during the candles. Today is day 17. The last time I spoke to you about Ukraine, two weeks ago, just after the war had started, I was still trying to stay continuously informed, reading as much as I could, as often as I could. But as Jen also said, you can't keep that pace up. Despite my intense interest, I've not been able to sustain that level of attention. The stories of Ukrainian resistance continue to lift my spirits when I read about them or hear about them. The stories of the brutality coming out of the cities and towns under Russian occupation continue to break my heart. The flood of news, the pace of it is overwhelming, and there is only so much heartbreak that a girl can take in a day. The need for self-care has outweighed the need to know everything. And besides, there are many other things that also need doing and attending to. I hope that you have also been taking care of yourselves in whatever ways you have needed to this week. One of the things that I have been making a point of reading every day, however, is a public war diary written by Ukrainian journalist and author Yevgenia Belorusets, Yevgenia Belorusets, which is updated every day at 4 p.m. our time. In it, she writes about what she observes each day as she walks through her neighborhood in Kyiv. And this week, as I was trying to catch up on email and begin working on this sermon about faith, her entry from day 10 caught my attention. Day 10 was last Saturday, the 5th of March. In her wanderings that day, Belarusets met a young man named Kirill. He told her that before the war started, he'd been a part of the blossoming nightclub scene in Kyiv. But, as she said, now, nearly every day, he makes the almost unimaginable trek from the eastern bank of the Dnieper River across to the western bank to cook food in the kitchen of a restaurant for people who are in bomb shelters and for the Kyiv territorial defense. When his time permits, he said, he engages in art and music and shamanism. She said that their conversation was a little strange. But one of the things that he said that struck me was this. He said it has become very difficult to have faith in others. As it turns out, they can suddenly throw bombs at other people and think they're right about it, too. Then, however, when he found out that she was a journalist, Kirill asked if Yevgenia could write about him in her journal. Maybe, she said. Well, if you do, he said, then I want you to say that everything that is happening at the moment is a great beauty. I must have looked at him in amazement, she wrote in her diary because he immediately launched into an explanation. He said, people are acting better than usual right now. They are coming together. They are taking care of each other. Everything is changing, he said. And I found myself thinking about that juxtaposition all week long as I thought about this sermon on faith. Now, I know that faith can be a difficult concept for many of those of us who are Unitarian Universalists, and you've probably heard sermons about faith through the years. It's been difficult for us for all the reasons that Sharon Salzberg outlines in the text that we heard as our reading this morning, because we often equate faith with doctrine or creeds or religious adherence, because we often assume the word faith is connected to a belief in God in which many of us perhaps no longer believe. 
As Harvey Cox, who is a professor at Harvard Emeritus now, and my advisor at Harvard Divinity School when I was there has written, for many people, faith and belief are just two words for the same thing, but they are not the same. Faith is about deep-seated confidence, whether in ourselves or in others or in some principle or value. Faith is about deep-seated confidence. Belief, on the other hand, is more like an opinion. He says, we can believe something to be true without it making much of a difference to us, but we place our faith only in something that is vital for the way we live. Salzburg talks a little bit about uh, theologian Paul Tillich's concept of faith. He talks about faith as alignment with our ultimate concerns those values to which we are most devoted, which form the core of what we care passionately about, what uh, is a centering point in our lives. The ultimate concern in which we put our faith could be, again, a value or a principle or a belief in the natural law, or it could even be, as Salzburg says, an aspiration. My colleague, and Annie's colleague, the Reverend Dr. Natalie Fenimore, an African-American UU minister, says that Shirley Chisholm was once asked why she, a black woman, was running for president. You don't have a chance. Why are you doing that? And she said, because I am in love with the America that does not yet exist. Hmm. Harvey Cox writes that for the earliest Christians, before creeds and councils and all of that, faith simply meant hope and assurance and the dawning of a new era of freedom and healing and compassion. Another aspiration. When Harvey Cox says that Jesus was a man of faith, he means that Jesus' confidence his deep and abiding confidence was in the coming reign of God, a new era of shalom or peace and wholeness, peace with justice. And what attracted Jesus' followers more than anything else, said Cox, was his emphasis on the possibility of another kind of world where gentleness and equality prevail. Those are all aspirations. And that aspiration of a world that is possible, a world ruled by kindness and um, gentleness, that aspiration resonates with me. And it may resonate with you too, even if you no longer believe in God, if you ever did, and even if you no longer count yourself a Christian, if you ever did. It's akin to what we UUs mean when we say that we aspire to affirm and promote the goal of world community with peace and liberty and justice for all. This is an aspiration in which it could be said we have placed our faith. It is among our ultimate concerns as UUs. It is central to and vital for the way that we live. James Fowler, in his book on the stages of faith, asks the following questions, which I offer to you for a moment of your own reflection. On what or on whom do you set your heart? To what vision of right relatedness between humans and nature and the transcendent are you loyal? What hope and what grounds of hope animate you and give shape to the force field of your life and to how you move into it? Those are some questions for you to consider. And that is one way of thinking about faith as a deep-seated confidence but there is another way of thinking about faith that I want to touch on this morning, not entirely unrelated, but 
slightly different in aspect. Wilfred Cantwell Smith, who is a scholar of world religions, once said that faith is a quality of human living. At its best, it has taken the form of serenity and courage and loyalty and service, a quiet confidence and joy which enables one to feel at home in the universe and to find meaning in the world and in one's life, a meaning that is profound and ultimate and is stable no matter what may happen to oneself at the level of immediate event. This kind of faith allows us to face catastrophe and confusion, affluence and sorrow unperturbed, and to face opportunity with conviction and drive, and face others with cheerful charity, says Smith. Now I read that description of faith and I think, would that we could all develop such a faith that allows us to maintain a sense of quiet confidence and joy, a sense of equanimity no matter what news comes to us, no matter what disturbing thoughts come to us, to be able to maintain that quiet confidence no matter what the news. And isn't that exactly what we want for our kids and our teens in our faith development programs, I think? to encourage them to learn how to develop that quiet confidence for themselves. In writing about that meaning of faith as a quality of life, Salzburg refers to the story of Aeneas, the hero of Virgil's poem about the founding of Rome, and she talks about his story as an archetypal journey of faith. When Aeneas flees the battle of Troy, he has no idea where he's going or what lies beyond him. On his way to do one thing, he finds himself blown by storm and fortune and doing another. His ships and crews are battered and plundered and attacked. But girded by a faint yet compelling sense of mission, he again and again faces the unknown. In this sense, according to Salzburg, faith entails the understanding that we don't know how things will unfold, and it enables us to fully engage while also realizing that we are not control, in control of outcomes. Salzburg says the opposite of faith is not doubt, it is despair. While Anne Lamott says that the opposite of doubt of faith is not doubt, it is certainty. And those two things are related because despair, in a certain sense, can be thought of as the certainty that things will turn out badly. When we have the kind of faith that Salzburg is talking about, we can maintain that sense of quiet confidence and stability and equanimity and level-headedness no matter what is happening in the world. I want to come back for a minute to the conversation that Yevgenia Belarus uh, had with a young man in Kyiv named Kirill and how he said it was very difficult to have faith in others because as it turns out, they can suddenly throw bombs at other people and think they're in the right about it too. This week, I, after having read that, happened upon the writings of a man named uh, Jean Amery, who was a member of the Nazi resistance in World War II and spent two years or so in concentration camps before being liberated. He once said in his essays, the expectation of help, the certainty of help, is indeed one of the fundamental experiences of human beings. But the gravest loss produced by the Holocaust was that it radically undermined that element of trust in the world, the certainty that by reason of written or unreasoned social contracts, the, that the other person will spare me. More precisely stated, that the other person will respect my physical and with it also my metaphysical being. 
Jean Ameri lost faith in humankind because of his, exper his experience of not being helped, expecting help from the world and not getting it. He sank into despair and he later took his own life. But Kirill, this young man in Kiev, so far he has not yet lost his faith and hopefully he will not because he is still able also to see the great beauty of humans caring for and helping other humans. He is still able to hold on to the both and rather than the either or. Jewish theologian Irving Greenberg, who also wrote extensively about the Holocaust, once said that faith is living life in the presence of the Redeemer even when the world is unredeemed. After Auschwitz, faith, faith means that there are times when faith is overcome. We now have to speak of faith moments, moment faiths, moments when redeemer and vision of redemption are present, interspersed with times when the flames and smoke of the burning children blot out our faith. Why, he says, is it not a permanent destruction of faith to be in the presence of such destruction? One reason is that there are still moments when the reality of the exodus is enacted in the presence. Neither exodus nor Easter, says Greenberg, wins out or is totally blotted out by the atrocities of Buchenwald but we encounter both polar experiences, the good and the bad, and a life of faith is lived between them in these moment faiths. I very much like this notion of moment faiths. Sure, there are times when I am in danger of losing my faith in people, of losing my confidence that there is another world that is possible beyond this one. But those moments don't blot out the reality that there are also moments of great beauty in this world. Faith does not need to be something that we lose ever, but it is something that can be renewed over and over again through the witness of goodness and the practice of love. There's a favorite quote from Howard Zinn's writing that I loved and I may have, shared with it, may have shared it with you before. Howard Zinn writes, to be hopeful in bad times is not just foolishly romantic. It is based on the fact that human history is a history not only of cruelty, but also of compassion, sacrifice, courage, kindness, if we remember those times and places, and there are so many where people have behaved magnificently, this gives us the energy to act and at least the possibility of sending the spinning top of a world in a different direction. And this is the way that that young man, Kirill, saw the world, sees the world. And that's what Yevgenia Belarus sees as she walks around Kiev every day with her camera and her notepad, what she sees when she returns home each afternoon to type up her daily journal entry and to send it out to the world, the mix of the good and the bad, the both and the and, the small villages that are swallowed up by the ravages of war and the big city that lives on in the stories of real people who reside there. On Tuesday, day 13, she told the story of a group of elderly ladies and gentlemen, actresses and actors who are part of a theater group for seniors in Kyiv who've chosen to stay in the city. They don't want to leave Kyiv, she said. They want to stay and they want to help. I must add, she says, that these talented people know hundreds of poems by heart and they sing beautifully. Now they don't want to just help. They say they want to join the territorial defense. I try to imagine this 
she says, and I suddenly think, with such defenders, nothing can happen to this city. May we too come to have such a faith in the goodness, the beauty, a faith that steadies, a faith that sustains, a moment's faith that is able always to see and bear witness to those moments of redemption amidst the ruins. I have already warned Brad about this, but I want to let you in on it too. I'd like to have us change the order and the order of service and have our hymn now and then do our heritage moment that we promised for you. And so I'd like to invite you to join in body or in spirit at this time to sing our next hymn, which I don't have written down here for me. 126, fantastic. It is in your order of service and also in your hymnals. Let us rise and sing. Good morning. Till my glasses on. I'm Maureen Ricicci, a member of the Interim Ministry Transition Team, along with Meredith McCulloch, Doug Muter, Tina Nappy, Rebecca Green Neal, Kath McCafferty, and Doug Denny Brown. We're offering these heritage moments during services as a way for parishioners to look back before we look forward. This morning, we're going to focus on congregational growth. We invite you to join breakout sessions either on Zoom or in the sanctuary immediately after the service to share your own experience with church growth and imagine what growth possibilities there are in the near future. So let's take a look back at the years bridging the last century and the present one. By the 1990s, we were on the precipice of a new phase of growth. Then Minister John Gibbons encouraged, well, kind of pushed and then guided us to transition from what we call a pastoral church, usually about 200 plus members, to a larger program church, usually a congregation of 400 or more congregants with a different organizational structure reimagined pastoral staff and lay leadership roles, 
and a desire for growth in a variety of ways. The change from pastoral to program size has often been described as the most challenging of growth transitions for congregations. Change is challenging and complex. It's like the two sides of a coin. Gains and losses coexist. While there was a sense of enthusiasm and vibrancy that accompanied our expansion, I remember, and it's so important to acknowledge that for many longtime members, there was also an acute loss of their cozier church, a place where it was easy and possible to know everyone else in church, and where there were well-established traditions and ways of being together and serving one another in this historic meeting house. During this time, there were three kind of all-church efforts that moved us forward growth-wise. First, Karen Frederick led us through a formal and urgent space needs study of our building and its use. Then we had something called the values and visions process that led to the adoption of a mission covenant statement for us. And, well, I'm gonna let Chris Rabinowitz tell you about the third big effort. So Chris on Zoom. So 25 years ago, we were bursting at the seams. The problem was that our present, that our building didn't have enough space to accommodate anyone who wanted to be there. There wasn't enough room for adults. There weren't enough classrooms for RE. There wasn't enough administrative office space. And there was no place for anyone to have any private conversation. The kitchen was too small. After service, Fellowship Hall was busier than Quincy Market on a Saturday morning. And an available restroom was very hard to find. Something needed to be done. First up was reconsidering if we should stay on the common or find another location. If we stayed, the sanctuary space could be used as a multifunction space. Get rid of the pews, use chairs when needed instead, and we'd have one big space. Obviously that didn't happen. Once it was decided that we would renovate and add on, a building committee was formed. It was quite the experience, like so many that this church offers us. All the changes that we needed took courage, commitment, money, and time. We were given a one and a half million dollar project that would be funded by a capital campaign the endowment and a mortgage. Big question if we could do it. We had not done anything like this before and we needed to get it right. We had only so much footprint that we could add. Again, obviously we did it. The building committee met weekly for two years, shepherding the process through design and implementation. The upstairs was modified to include more bathrooms, our crowded fellowship hall gave way to classrooms like the overlook room. The addition added what we now call the common room, the ministers and RE director offices, the new kitchen and a slightly larger church office. The basement became more classrooms and bathrooms too. The elevator was updated and that west musty room down in the basement was finally dried out. For the capital campaign, parishioners made three and four year monetary commitments to raise the needed funds. We raised $575,000. This was quite the feat considering that some of us had young children with extraordinary daycare expenses. Others were facing retirement and fixed incomes. And many like my family felt the expenses of college looming. One of the most vigorously debated changes and difficult decisions was driven by accessibility. As we re renovated and added on new space in the back, it was easy to incorporate the changes needed. But what to do in the sanctuary? We had decided to leave the pews as is, but the chancel needed to be updated to accommodate all of us. The stairway was particularly dangerous. There were no handrails, the stairs curved and were full depth in the center, but graduated widths on the sides. We had no way to get someone in a wheelchair onto the chancel. 
After much searching, we came upon the lift that is now behind the candle stand. Even if we don't use it often, it's there when we need it. This makes me quite nostalgic, not so much for the pastoral church, but for the busyness and excitement all of us of all of us being inspired to do something together. There were many ups and downs during those years, so many diff decisions, often heart-wrenching, but we did it with love and as one community. I recall innumerable, time, innumerable times that the church has left the building, but 20 years ago, we demonstrated that we all knew how to take care of ourselves by recognizing what we needed and how to get it done. I'm forever grateful for the experience. Thank you so much to Chris and to Maureen uh, for those reflections on growth and what it has meant here. Some of uh, the experiences were captured by those comments and those of you who are here for that time have your own experiences to share. I just wanna remind you that after the service is over, there's an opportunity for you to gather in small groups, whether you're in the sanctuary where we have two transition team facilitators available, Rebecca and also Maureen, or whether you're on Zoom, where I think we have uh, four, up to four breakout room facilitators available. Uh, and you will have the opportunity, you will be invited to a breakout room. If you want to join that on Zoom, you can. And for all the groups, we're asking you to focus a little bit on these three questions. What has been your own experience of the growth at First Parish? What do you imagine will come next? How do you imagine we might regain our pre-pandemic sense of vibrancy? That's two questions in one. And then the third or fourth question is, what have been the tangible and intangible benefits to you and your family of participation at First Parish throughout the period of growth? So again, you're invited to participate if you'd like. If you wanna stay and chat with other people about unrelated things on Zoom or here, you're also, of course, welcome to do that. But that has been our heritage moment and I look forward to the conversation that will follow. For our closing words today, these words by Jim Wickman. May our faith sustain us, may our hope inspire us, and may our love surround us as we go our separate ways knowing that we will gather again in this beloved community. Go in peace and return again in peace. Amen. <laughs>